Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Per Oscarson. I'm a member of the Estate Planning and Probate uh, Group at Beresford Booth. I'm joined by Sarah Smith, another member of our Estate Planning and Probate Group. Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, the, the topic is <clears throat> common issues with minor inheritance. And we're going to expand that a little bit because the, the concept of estate planning is often thought of to be uh, just what happens to my assets when I pass away? Or what can I do with my assets while I'm alive? Well, with, with minors, there's another aspect to it, and that's the personal aspect. Because if there's something that happens to parents, uh, well, it could be good. You know, they're on vacation, but they need to have someone that can, that can uh, make decisions on behalf of their children if the children aren't accompanying them. Or uh, those kind of decisions after the parents have passed. So we want to touch a little bit also on the, the personal aspect of the estate planning as well as financial. And today, most of, our, most of our discussion will be on the financial aspect and distribution of assets. So uh, one of the things that we think about with, you know, with children, particularly during, during the lifetime uh, of those who would, who would do the estate planning, is you know, do they need to have someone who can, who can make medical decisions for them if for some reason the parents are not able to? The uh, best example I think of is mom and dad are going to take a vacation by themselves. They, they may or may not be reachable for whatever reason. So they grant someone, some third party, maybe a grandparent, for example, or a, a trusted friend, uh, the, the authority to, to make medical decisions on behalf of the children if there is no one with other, otherwise with legal authority to make those decisions. And that, can be, that will be upheld. Uh, the doctors, uh, doctors and nurses can certainly rely on a properly, uh, for example, a properly executed power of attorney that grants that kind of authority. Um, another, op another thing may be uh, nominating a guardian to take, uh, to take care of the child um, Again, if there's if there's uh, something where the, the parents are unable to do so, that's another that's another entire process and can be an expensive process. But it is one aspect I think of estate planning. One of the things we also think about is if you don't do any planning, whether it's during your lifetime or for to, to be effective upon your death, you have effectively made a plan, but you don't have control over. Uh, if you have not done a will, for example, you are treated as dying intestate. If you die intestate without a will, there could still be an administration of your estate, but you have effectively given up control of how your property is to be distributed. State law then steps in and provides, provides the answers. Uh, so the, the actual financial aspects. It is possible to make gifts to children during your lifetime. Uh, this year, uh, gifts can be made up to $16,000 to as many individuals as you like, including your children, without having to pay a gift, a federal gift tax, or and without having to file a federal gift tax return. Uh, there is no gift tax in the state of Washington. So uh, if you were to make a gift of that amount or greater, uh, there would not be a Washington gift tax return to be filed, but a federal gift tax return would have to be filed. Things change a little bit upon death. Uh, state law does not allow for gifts directly uh, or bequests directly to a minor. Uh, it does provide for other, other options, naming a custodian, for example, under a uh, Uniform Transfer to Minors Act account. Um, another option might be to have a trust that, that the money goes into trust for the child. That, that might be something that is set up in a will. Potentially, it is a trust that's set up during your lifetime, and maybe additional funds are provided for the trust in, in the will, uh, as an example. Uh, I mentioned the Uniform Transfer to Minors Act. This is an act that allows for a custodian to be named uh, who has control over the account, and that account may be set up at a, 
some sort of financial institution. Um, and depending upon the source of the funds, the funds may, may come out to the child when they reach 18. They may not come out, again, depending upon how the, how the, who or what the source of the funds may be, they may not come out until that child has reached the age of 21. And it is also possible in establishing such an account that you can provide that the funds do not come out until they reach age 25. But at that point, all the funds would come out to the child. Uh, I think most, most financial institutions will have the availability of such accounts. Uh, and, and the state law pretty well directs exactly how those, how those things work and how the custodian and what the custodian can do and how they do it. Uh, another option, uh, and this one is a little bit more limited in what it's, it's for, is what's known as a 529 plan. 529 is actually a reference to the section of the Internal Revenue Code that allows for these types of accounts and therefore educational purposes. Uh, they can be established well before the child reaches an age where they're going to attend an institution that requires the payment of tuition. Uh, in fact, it is possible to set up a, such an account before the child is born uh, or even before the child is adopted uh, because it is possible to change the beneficiary of the account uh, to that child once they are born or once they are adopted. Uh, most states have these accounts available. They, they differ from state to state as to uh, requirements of the account. For example, in some states, you have to be a resident of the state in order to participate in that state's 529 plan. Uh, in other states, uh, that is not the case. You may be a resident of Washington and participate in a plan uh, in Montana. I, I don't know off the top of my head whether Montana is one of those states that requires you be a resident but I know that there are several states that still have the availability of those types of accounts for non-residents. Uh, some may also have uh, requirements or limitations, restrictions on where that money can be spent. So for example, in a state, it may be required that uh, you have to attend a, an in, a public institution or, or private institution in that state where you have established the account. Uh, in some states, it is possible you can have the account set up in that state. You may not be a resident of that state, and the, the beneficiary of the account may not even attend a, an institution, a learning institution in that state. So it is important that when you consider those, these options, you take a look at some of, those, some of the other states to see whether they may have a, a plan that works better for you. Washington has a plan known as GET. Guaranteed education tuition. Uh, you buy units. Uh, it is based on the, the units are figured on the the cost of education at the highest at the highest cost public institution in the state of Washington. But at least in Washington, you can use that those funds uh, at institutions in other states, and I think it's also possible to use them internationally. So. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Sarah, who's going to talk about trusts and the availability of trusts and different types of trusts uh, in planning for minors. Sarah? Thank you very much. Um, as Pera was just discussing, there are uh, a handful of options that, for example, the UTMA, the 529s, and these can be a great way to provide support in specific methods, but they do have some limitations. 529 accounts are meant to be used for education related expenses. UTMA can only be stretched as far as 25 years of age. Might be great for a handful of bonds. Might not be quite so great if you're talking about a $5 million estate that could end up in the hands of a child. Uh, you know, the brain of, a, of an 18 year old is gonna be different than the brain of a 25 year old and so far up the line. Trusts provide a really great opportunity for us to uh, do additional customization, essentially. So we can, instead of be limited by that 25 year, uh, that age uh, imposed by the Uniform Transfers to Minors Act, we can state that uh, funds are held for a longer period of time, 35, 40, 45. Actually, 
let me back up slightly. Uh, we might have some new viewers here. Let's give everybody a, a common vocabulary, make sure we stay on the same page. Um, generally speaking, trusts are a great way to divide uh, essentially control and dominion over assets. We give the trustee the role of, of legal ownership and management of these assets and the beneficiary gets to enjoy them, gets to receive the benefit of these assets. So when we're talking about minor children, we're talking about establishing an older responsible individual who will manage the funds on behalf of the child and make sure that that child is receiving the benefits that you as the, the client and we as the drafters have dictated during the child's uh, lifetime and the duration of the trust. Trusts, as I was saying uh, just before, are great because they're very customizable. There is some administrative work that goes into it. It's gonna be more expensive than an outright gift, but, uh, or even the UTMA or the uh, 529 plans. But when we're talking again about larger gifts, uh, more complex planning, often this is well worth the cost. So what can we do with a trust? Um, very common when we're looking at trusts for minors, we are setting them up in such a way so that the trustee who's managing these assets is empowered to make distributions on behalf of the child or children for what, uh, what we typically call health education maintenance and support standard. We're not necessarily taking the whole first grade class to Disneyland, but we'll be able to take uh, the child on a family trip, make sure that they're going to good schools, summer camp, um, and make sure that these kids are taken care of. As the children get older and their needs develop, um, there might be special language that allows for payment of a wedding or secondary education or the down payment of a house. And working together, we decide, or you decide, at what age we think that child or children will be able to have the responsibility of having access to the larger underlying balance of that trust. Maybe we say, we'll give a third of that remaining trust balance to the child at 25, the next third at 30, and the final third, the remaining balance at 35. And we give them a couple of steps to figure out how to manage money. Maybe they run through the first third at 25 and make some questionable decisions. And by the time they get to the rest, they know what they're doing. Maybe they have other resources, they're gonna be fine. We're gonna hold that until retirement age and force them to plan for retirement. There's so many different things that you can do with trusts. Um, very often we call these sorts of trust sprinkling trusts where we're uh, taking care of children during their youth and then providing uh, a series of payments during adulthood. Um, and this works for a lot of families separated to so many shares as there are children, everybody gets their portion and off we go. But in some situations, you may find that you have a child, uh, your family may have children that have a broader age gap. Um, one of your children was born eight years after the other, 10 years after the other. And if you start uh, dividing the shares immediately, then you're gonna have one kid who's practically off to college and the other one who still may have years of braces and summer camps and other expenses that would eat into his share of the estate. So maybe we have a conversation about what's called a, often a common pot trust. We keep everything together to take care of all of the kids for these specified uses, the health education maintenance support until the youngest one reaches 18 or 24 or graduates college or whatever deadline we set. And then whatever's left over, then that gets split between the children. This provides an opportunity to make sure that everyone benefits equally, maybe not receiving an equal share of the money at the end of the day, but making sure that everyone benefits equally in terms of the growth and support during these important early years. Um, and I, I bring this up to put it on your radar, but also as an example of the kind of flexibility that is uh, available in trust planning and the kinds of things that we're thinking about when we're doing uh, this kind of planning. As Perry was saying earlier, it's very easy to fall into the trap of thinking that estate planning is about money. 
And it is in part, I'd be a liar if I said otherwise, but what we're really doing is we're utilizing our tools to plan for the safety in the, of your family and yourselves and what this will look like in practice to support your family over their lifetime. Hmm. Um, and so a large part of that conversation is going to be very situation specific. What are the assets in question? How old are your children? What is the age spread? Um, are there any children who may have disabilities or special needs and either are on or may uh, in all likelihood in the future be receiving government assistance? And how do we plan around that so that we don't interfere with the receipt of that government assistance, um, often by the use of what are called special needs trusts, which unlike the, the two trusts I was discussing earlier, the sort of more common sprinkling trusts or common pot trusts, these are set up in such a way that we're not providing for, for the health education, the typical health education maintenance and support standard. We're providing for those expenses which are not covered by the government assistance. So as to uh, make sure that those programs are maintained and stretch the assets a bit further by not forcing them to run through them before being able to qualify again. Um, there's a whole conversation there that I'm not gonna get too deep into. But again, this is another thing that when we're planning for minors, we really wanna be aware of what the situation is and adjusting around that so that we're not creating unintended consequences, interfering with government benefits for somebody who's going to need that kind of Medicaid support or what have you for the foreseeable future making sure that we're not leaving an outright gift to a child um, and making some other plan so that, you know, if heaven forbid this child is, is slated to inherit funds outright, which as Paris said, you know, the court's not gonna let you do, we have rules against that. Um, we have something in place to avoid a costly guardianship process. Um, and which specific tool we use is, is just gonna depend on the circumstances and be, a part of that conversation. Um, but as always, you know, the best thing that you can do in any situation is plan in advance and not sit back and wait um, for uh, the government to decide and the laws to decide what's gonna be the best choice for your family. Um, so that's, that's kind of broad overview. Uh, some of the options available, some of the conversations that we'll typically have with people who, who come in who have minor children or perhaps are, are thinking about leaving gifts to nieces and nephews. Um, I see we've got a few people in the room with us. I just want to give a chance for anyone to ask questions uh, if there are any. Otherwise, uh, we won't keep you all day. I'm sure it's a beautiful rainy day out there for everyone else. Um, Pear, I don't know if you had any other comments that you wanted to add. There was just one thing on the on the uh, the special needs trust, mm -hmm. uh, which probably doesn't affect most minor children, and that is the fact that that an individual's own assets can be used to fund such a trust, or it could be assets of someone else. For example, a parent might use their own funds to provide a special needs trust for their child. Uh, there is a big difference. In, in the treatment of those mm -hmm. um, in one very important respect, and that is, is really only upon death of the beneficiary, where the beneficiary's assets were used, they're not, they are not counted against uh, eligibility requirements for any uh, governmental benefits. But when the, when the beneficiary does receive benefits, and, they, and their own funds or their own property, because it could be something other than cash that's in the trust, when their own assets have been used to fund the trust, the government has a right to be reimbursed for the benefits that were provided to that beneficiary during their lifetime. And it can include reimbursement for benefits that were received by the beneficiary even before the special needs trust existed. Whereas if you have a what's called a third party special needs trust, for example, where the parent funds with their own assets, a special needs trust for the benefit of their child, there is no reimbursement requirement for that situation. And so it, it is 
potentially problematic if if the beneficiary's own assets are used, because if a significant amount of assets are used and the trust is not in existence for a great deal of time before the beneficiary were to pass away, there could be a significant reduction in the amount of assets that might otherwise be available to be distributed after the government has been, been reimbursed for the benefits that they have provided. So that's, that's another uh, important thing to consider when you are making those kind of plans. Mm -hmm. I didn't see any other questions from anyone. No. So I think with that, we'll close for today. We thank you very much for joining us. We hope you'll join join the, the firm webinar next Thursday and uh, enjoy the enjoy the wonderful weather we have. Thank you. Bye-bye.